Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Duncan White. Uh, I convene the Writers Speak series for the Mahindra Humanities Center. And today, I have the great privilege of welcoming to campus Ruth Ozeki, who will be in conversation with Meng Jin. <laughs> the Writers Speak series, established by Claire Massoud, allows us to bring wonderful writers here to talk about their work. But that can only happen because the Mahindra has such a strong team. And I'd like to take a moment to thank our director, Susie Clark, executive director, Steve Beale, and Mary McKinnon, the events coordinator, and the whole team that helps things run so smoothly. So thank you. So I'm going to try and be brief, but it's hard because of uh, Ruth's formidable career. Um, she's a novelist, filmmaker, professor, and Zen Buddhist priest. After starting out making films, including the celebrated 1995 documentary, Halving the Bones, Ruth published her first novel, My Year of Meats, in 1998, establishing her as a major new writer. Her second and third novels, All Over Creation and A Tale for the Time Being, drew ever greater critical acclaim and a host of richly deserved awards. Her most recent novel, The Book of Form and Emptiness, won the 2020 Women's Prize for Fiction and was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize. Ruth is the Grace Jarko Ross 1933 Professor of the Humanities in the English Department at Smith, where she teaches creative writing. In 2010, Ruth was ordained as a Soto Zen Buddhist priest, and she's affiliated with the Brooklyn Zen Center and the Everyday Zen Foundation. Uh, as many of you will know, Ruth's novels have become a fixture on Harvard's syllabi over recent years, and the subject of many a student research project and senior thesis. Indeed, Ru's third novel, A Tale for the Time Being, is one of the key texts being offered in Meng Jin's creative writing workshop this semester. The title of the course is, fittingly enough, The Good Stuff. As well as being a visiting lecturer in creative writing here at Harvard, Meng is an author carving out a reputation as one of the most exciting new voices in contemporary fiction. Her first novel, Little Gods, published in 2020, was a finalist for the LA Times First Fiction Prize and the New York Public Library Young Lions Award. Last year, she published a collection of short stories, self-portrait with ghost. Okay, so today Ruth will start with a short reading from her uh, most recent novel, The Book of Form and Emptiness, which is wonderful, and if you haven't read it, you really must. And then she will um, chat with Meng, and that will be a real privilege to listen to. Then after that, there's going to be an opportunity for audience questions. Um, I just ask that if you do have a question, we'll We'll try and get to as many of you as possible. Just make sure that you raise your hand and wait for the mic to come to you and uh, so that everybody can hear it, basically. Um, OK, so please raise your hand for uh, Ruth Ozeki. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming inside on a beautiful day. Uh, it's it's really wonderful to be here. You know, I, I uh, when I was when I was a young person um, back in the last millennium, um, I, I spent a lot of time in Cambridge, and uh, you know, I so driving around today, it was really astonishing to you know be driving down these streets that. I lived on, that I partied on, that, you know, it was kind of bringing back all of these ghosts. Um, so that was, that was, uh, that was really wonderful. And it's great to, be, it's great to be here at Harvard. Ah. Thank you. Now I've got two little balls <laughs> dancing around. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit um, just from the beginning of uh, the, my uh, latest book, which is The Book of Form and Emptiness. Um, and um, I think then Meng and I can talk about it, and if you have any questions about that or any of the other work too, of course, I'd love to um, turn it into more of a discussion, a conversation, um, because I think conversations are really important. So, the book of form and emptiness. In the beginning, a book must start somewhere. One brave letter must volunteer to go first, laying itself on the line in an act of faith from which a word takes heart and follows, drawing a sentence into its wake. From there, a paragraph amasses, and soon a page, and the book is on its way, 
finding a voice, calling itself into being. A book must start somewhere, and this one starts here. A boy. Shh, listen. That's my book, and it's talking to you. Can you hear it? It's okay if you can't, though. It's not your fault. Things speak all the time, but if your ears aren't attuned, you have to learn to listen. You can start by using your eyes, because eyes are easy. Look at all the things around you. What do you see? A book, obviously. And obviously, the book is speaking to you. So try something more challenging. The chair you're sitting on, the pencil in your pocket, the sneaker on your foot, still can't hear? Then get down on your knees and put your head to the seat, or take off your shoe and hold it to your ear. No, wait, if there are people around, they'll think you're mad, so try it with the pencil first. Pencils have stories inside them, and they're safe as long as you don't stick the point in your ear. Just hold it next to your head and listen. Can you hear the wood whisper? the ghost of the pine, the mutter of lead? Sometimes it's more than one voice. Sometimes it's a whole chorus of voices rising from a single thing, especially if it's a made thing with lots of different makers. But don't be scared. I think it depends on the kind of day they were having back in Guangdong or Laos or wherever. And if it was a good day at the old sweatshop, if they were enjoying a pleasant thought at the moment when that particular grommet came tumbling down the line and passed through their fingers, then that pleasant thought will cling to the whole. Sometimes it's not so much a thought as a feeling, a nice warm feeling, like love, for example, sunny and yellow. But when it's a sad feeling, or an angry one that gets laced into your shoe, then you better watch out, because that shoe might do crazy shit, like marching your feet right up to the front of the Nike store, for example, where you could wind up smashing the display window with a baseball bat made of furious wood. If that happens, it's still not your fault. Just apologize to the window, say I'm sorry to the glass, and whatever you do, don't try to explain. The arresting officer doesn't care about the crappy conditions in the bat factory. He won't care about the chainsaws or the sturdy ash tree that the bat used to be. So just keep your mouth shut. Stay calm. Be polite. Remember to breathe. It's really important not to get upset because then the voices will get the upper hand and take over your mind. Things are needy. They take up space. They want attention, and they'll drive you mad if you let them. So just remember, you're like the air traffic controller. No, wait, you're like the leader of a big brass band made up of all the jazzy stuff of the planet, and you're floating out there in space, standing on this great garbage heap of a world with your hair slicked back and your natty suit and your stick up in the air, surrounded by all the eager things. And for one quick, beautiful moment, all their voices go silent, waiting till you bring your baton down. Music or madness, it's totally up to you. The book. So, start with the voices then. When did he first hear them? When he was still little? Benny was always a small boy and slow to develop, as though his cells were reluctant to multiply and take up space in the world. It seems he pretty much stopped growing when he turned 12, the same year his father died and his mother started putting on weight. The change was subtle, but Benny seemed to shrink as Annabelle grew, as if she were metabolizing her small son's grief along with her own. Yes. That seems right. So perhaps the voices started around then too, shortly after Kenny died? It was a car accident that killed him. No, it was a truck. Kenny O was a jazz clarinetist, but his real name was Kenji, so we'll call him that. He played swing mostly, big band stock, stuff at weddings and bar mitzvahs and in campy downtown hipster clubs where the dudes all wore beards and pork pie hats and checkered shirts and mothy tweed jackets from the Salvation Army. He'd been playing a gig and afterwards he went out drinking or drugging or whatever he did with his musician friends, 
just a little toot, but enough so that on his way home, when he stumbled and fell in the alley, he didn't see the necessity of getting up right away. He wasn't far from home, only a few yards from the rickety gate that led to the back of his house. If he'd managed to crawl a bit further, he would have been okay. But instead, he just lay there on his back in a dim pool of light cast by the street lamp above the Gospel Mission thrift shop dumpster. The long chill of winter had begun to lift, and a spring mist hung in the alleyway. He lay there, gazing up at the light and the tiny particles of moisture that swarmed brightly in the air. He was drunk, or high, or both. The light was beautiful. Earlier in the evening, he'd had a fight with his wife. Maybe he was feeling sorry. Maybe, in his mind, he was vowing to do better. Who knows what he was doing? Maybe he fell asleep. Let's hope so. In any case, that's where he was still lying an hour or so later, when the delivery truck came rattling down the alleyway. So I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to stop before anything really bad happened. <laughs> Hi, Ruth. Hi. Um, it's such a pleasure to hear you read from your novel. Oh. Um, I shouldn't be surprised that um, the writer of a novel about um, animate objects is able to animate her readings <laughs> um, so lovely. You know, it, it's lovely something way. that um, I think when I was making films, mm -hmm. I had to do a lot of, you know, I couldn't hire actors because I had no money. Um, and so I had to do a lot of the narration myself. Oh, and that's, that's really where I learned to, I learned to read. I learned to, you know, uh, to do that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. Well, I have a question about your films later, but mm. maybe we should start with the mm. book. Um, okay, so I want to start with form, <laughs> which um, is a Buddhist principle, yeah. but also an aesthetic yeah. principle. Um, your books have um, quite strange forms, mm -hmm. and I think they're only getting stranger. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> For example, in this book, there are um, the book is a character itself, the right? Book as, is a character, as, as you've heard in that brief reading. But there's also books within the book. Yeah. Um, your previous books, um, your first book, My Year of Meats, um, use plays with documentary film mm -hmm. as a storytelling device as well, yeah. and then t A Tale for the Time Being has a diary inside of it, as well as a writer named Ruth who's writing a memoir. Yeah. There's, it's, you could call it like hybridity of form, mm -hmm. but, um, but also I feel that like when I read your books, um, I feel not just the pleasures of novel reading, but like the pleasures of reading other forms of books. Like I learn things mm -hmm. as I would in a nonfiction book. I feel like I get advice. <laughs> I feel like I am like, oh, maybe like after reading this chapter, I feel like I know how to live a little better. Nice. <laughs> um, and so I guess I wonder um, how you think about form as an aesthetic yeah. principle and if that's like related to the 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 Buddhist idea of form, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. also that's how so your weird forms arise. Yeah. Oh, that's such a lovely question. Um, and, and there's just so many ways to approach it, too. Uh, you know, when I, um, when I started writing, uh, I mean, the first book I wrote was My Year of Meats, and I was coming from a film background, right? And, um, and, and so I was... You know, I had a very visual orientation at that time, and I was also, um, because I'd been doing so much work in the editing room, um, and I was working a lot with montage, mm -hmm. um, which of course is a, f you know, a film principle, right? And, um, and I think I, I, I didn't, honestly, I didn't know how to write a novel. Um, it, you know, it was the first novel I'd really tried to write in any, you know, with any seriousness. And I really didn't know how to go about 
you know, approaching it. So I think what I ended up doing was um, just taking the kinds of things that I would do in film, in documentary film work, you know, really relying on montage, relying on, you know, found footage and, you know, um, uh, I, I used a lot of found footage in, in the various films um, that I'd made and, and sort of layering and piling those things, you know, sort of integrating those, weaving those things in. Um, and, and the book kind of grew out of that. Um, it was really because I didn't know any better. Um, and, and, you know, and so it was, it was interesting to me. I mean, I think in a way, you know, because I never, I never went to an MFA program. <laughs> um, I, you know, I was just kind of making it up as I went along. And so there are faxes in there, there's shopping lists, there's scripts from documentary shows, there's, I mean, I can't even remember, but there's a lot of different, um, this idea of, um, you know, of sort of, evident, material as evidence, text as evidence was, um, because I was very much concerned in that book with um, uh, notions of authenticity, right? And, um, and, and actually that's a theme I think that continues through all of the work. Um, so this idea of, of sort of um, using uh, text as evidence was something that I was very much playing with that. And, um, and that kind of continued in all of the work too. Um, Introducing different kinds of textual sources into the main, um, you know, in, into the main story. Uh, yeah. So I, uh, and and two, the last two books in particular are very much about young people who, in various ways, sort of save their lives through reading and writing. You know, and so it's it's about the the sort of life saving um, power of you know written material, um, either uh, you know doing the. I mean, in Now's case, she's you know she's writing her diary. Um, in Benny's case, he's hearing the voice of his book speaking to him, right? Um, which is kind of what you do when you write. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, it's lovely to hear you say that about um, just sort of that you never got an MFA, so nobody told you you couldn't do it. Nobody told right? me I couldn't do it. Right, 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 right. right. Awesome. You know, it was funny because um, in the first book, My Year of Meets, um, it's told from two points of view. Mm -hmm. um, one is the point of view of, of uh Jane Takagi Little, who's a documentary filmmaker, and she speaks in the first person. So she's an I voice. And then there's Akiko Ueno, who um, is written in a subjective, close, third-person voice. And, you know, again, I, 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 that was what, the way I was kind of hearing those voices. And I remember, you know, writing in alternating, you know, chapters, Aki, you know, Jane's chapter and then Akiko's chapter, Jane's chapter, Akiko's chapter. And, and I remember thinking, you know, this is not okay um, to have two different points of view like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought it was inconsistent, but I still couldn't do much about it because that's how I was, you know, hearing it. But I, and I remember thinking this is a problem because at some point the two of, I knew the two of them were going to meet and they were going to appear in the same scene at once. And I remember thinking, I mean, it's so stupid, but I remember thinking like, how am I going to do that? How am I going to combine, you know, like a third person and a, you know, a first person, you know, narrative voice in one scene? Yeah. But, I mean, you just write two consecutive scenes, right? <laughs> but at the time, I remember thinking, this is, this is going to be a nightmare. I don't know how to handle this. And then, of course, it was absolutely fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so my next question is about emptiness. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I was so thrilled when I heard you were writing a book called The Book of Form and Emptiness because both of those words um, felt so magnetic to mm -hmm. me. Um, and then when I bought this book, I was like, hmm, it doesn't look very empty. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Um, and part of the sort of, I guess, like driving energy of the reading, for me at least, was um, when do we get to the emptiness? Like, how is this book about emptiness? And when we get to that moment, I don't want to ruin it for people who um, haven't read it, but there's a character who sort of reaches um, a, a moment of perhaps enlightenment, mm. right? Mm. And, and, and that's when um, they understand the concept of emptiness, mm. but that moment is also 
very full. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it, in fact, it feels like the opposite of yes. emptiness. So I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about what emptiness, emptiness means, yeah. means to you yeah. when it came into the conception of the book yeah. and how um, you um, try to express it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, emptiness is one of those words that is, um, it, it's a Buddhist term, and it really suffers in translation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the Sanskrit word is shunyata, um, and which means, which does mean emptiness, but it, it, it has a, it doesn't have quite that negative connotation that emptiness does. Um, you know, the sense of void. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really have that connotation. Um, when it's translated into, uh, into Chinese and Japanese, the character that's used is ku in Japanese, um, or the, it's the character for sky. Right, which has a very different kind of feeling. It, uh, the sky doesn't necessarily feel empty. It feels vast, it feels spacious, right? But it doesn't feel empty in that kind of very negative way. Um, and, but the, the, when it got translated into English, the word that is commonly used is emptiness. Um, some people are now using the word boundlessness mm. for shunyata. And, um, and that's kind of interesting, even though that has other <laughs> other kind of connotations that doesn't quite work for me either. So, uh, anyway, the the idea about uh, emptiness is really that it's the um, it's the uh, sort of the balancing principle to form, right? Um, which doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing there, as you point out. It's it's actually it could also be everythingness. Right, emptiness could also be like everythingness, but in an unformed state. Right, and so there's this location um, in the book, the the bindery, right, um, which is a bindery in the basement of this public library, and it's the place where it's an abandoned bindery because binderies, as we know, aren't really needed anymore um, as we move into digital formats. Um, but in this in this bindery, it's a place where um, everything is unbound. Right, where all everything in the universe is kind of exists in an unbound state, and um, and that's kind of what I was thinking of. Um, and I guess the way that you know, it, it, emptiness is one of those concepts that's hard to to visualize or to wrap your head around. But the um, the the image that I that I like and I think works um, works pretty well is the image. If you can imagine emptiness as being um, a, just a vast, vast ocean, right? Just this enormous, like, endless ocean of emptiness. So enormous that you can't, that there's no horizon, there's no edge to it. It just goes on and on forever. And you imagine, you know, this, this vast ocean, in this vast ocean of emptiness, right, that the, the planet starts to turn and the, you know, wind starts to blow and the moon waxes and, um, and, from this ocean, right, a little wave starts to form, right? And, um, and the wave gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And it, it looks around, it's got this little white hat on its head, you know, and it kind of looks around and it, it thinks, wow, you know, like, look at me, I'm really, you know, I'm really something, right? I'm this thing, I'm this wave, I have form, I am, you know, I am bigger and better and taller than all of this emptiness around me. Um, I'm different from it, I'm separate from it, I'm apart. Um, and the wave is feeling very pleased with itself and it rolls along, you know, very happy with itself until, you know, the planet turns and the winds die down and the moon wanes and then the little wave starts to drop down again and it, you know, it doesn't like this at all. And it's just like, no, you know. And then it gets subsumed into the vast ocean of emptiness again. And so this idea of form and emptiness, of course, being inextricably, I mean, they're the same thing, right? Mm. You can't separate the form from the emptiness or the emptiness from the form. Um, and, and I think that, as a metaphor anyway, it, 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 uh, it, it kind of gives more of a feeling for what emptiness might be. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, I love that... Um, I feel that you're, especially the last two books, are so interested in these concepts that meet um, at the mis middle mm. of perhaps two opposing concepts um, and have um, this 
um, almost sense of like formal paradox mm -hmm. inside them. Like um, you've you've talked about a tale for the time being as a performance of no self, mm. of the Buddhist um, concept of no yeah. self, yeah. and. Um, in this performance of No Self, you have a uh, confessional diary mm -hmm. and a um, writer who's trying to write a memoir, right? So two very, <laughs> very, very selfie uh, texts yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. talking to each other. And then similarly, in, you know, in this book about form and emptiness, mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like, you know, proliferating with forms and, mm -hmm. and, um, and books and texts. Um, so I, um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about like um, that tension mm. and um, if um, that's um, a productive tension mm -hmm. for you mm -hmm. and why you're why you're interested in in those spaces. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the idea of no self um, is uh, again uh, you know it, it's. Uh, very central to, to Mahayana Buddhism, and um, and I think the wave analogy um, is an illustration of that. Right, the wave thinks of itself as a self, right, and it thinks it's separate from other selves, right, um, and but then of course it's not, right, and and that's I think the same thing is true for all of us, right, um, and so um, but stories are. You know, story. The wave has its story about who it is, right? Um, and that story is is real, right? Um, but I think that what um, what I'm interested in in both of these last two books, um, and again, this is a kind of Buddhist principle, but um, the idea that um, that of of um, you know interdependence of dependent co arising. Right, mm -hmm. and and so the relationship that the wave and the ocean have, you know, the ocean of emptiness um, has, is a relationship of dependent co-arising. That the wave can't exist without the emptiness, you know, the form can't exist without right. the emptiness. The wave can't exist without the ocean. The ocean can't exist without the wave. You know, they're they're um, they're mutually, you know, dependent upon each other. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's a description of us. Right, um, and it's also a description of the literary process, um, and and I think both the Book of Form and Emptiness and um, A Tale for the Time Being are talking about exactly that, mm -hmm. about the relationship between a writer and a reader, or the relationship between a reader and a book, right? Um, and that these are, you know, in in the Book of Form and Emptiness, the the book is the narrator of itself. Right, um, and the book is narrating itself into being, but it's also, of course, narrating the boy into being. But you can also, it's a kind of chicken and the egg conundrum because you can also ask, you know, which came first, the book or the boy, right? Because um, they're both, it's a kind of mutual act of co-creation. And, and I really think that that's, a, uh, uh, you know, a very um, accurate description of what happens, you know, in literature. Um, you know, that, that I write, you know, I have my relationship with my book, right? Um, and I, I write it, um, and then I put the book out into the world, and, you know, it's, it's so interesting because we think of it as, you know, a book. This is a book. It's a singular object, right? Um, and, and so, you know, we think we're talking about the same thing when we're talking about the book of form and emptiness, right? But we're not. Right, um, and so the book of form and emptiness that you read is you read it because you brought your own lived experience to the page, right? And you co-created your version of the book of form and emptiness, right? And so the same thing holds true for every single person who's read this book, right? There are as many different books of form and emptiness as there are readers who pick it up and read it. And so, you know, in that way, even though we think of it as a singular object, it's not. And it's also a dynamic object, right? In that it doesn't have, well, so it doesn't have a form, right? It, it is constantly shifting and changing. Um, and, and that's the relationship that the books are about too. The books are about this kind of relationship. Now, in, in A Tale for the Time Being, you know, now is this young girl who is having a relationship over time and space with this, you know, the, the woman Ruth who has found her diary and has picked it up and read it, right? And, and Ruth is also oddly kind of shaping now, at, you know, even though it, they exist in two different 
you know, time and space, you know, periods, right? Places and periods. Um, and but you know this this kind of act of co-creation still exists because you know every time a reader of course reads a book the book comes to life again right um, which is I think that's the alchemy that's the beauty of you know what it is that we do right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like even though this is um, something that's specific to maybe consciously specific yeah. to your last two books. Yeah. In my year of meets, there's also a work of art that brings mm. two people together who otherwise would not have that's right. met together. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's so right. This, you, you, I guess you've well, been thinking about this for a while. Yeah, <laughs> no, and I think that's where it comes from. Yeah. Um, you know, all of my books, including um, uh, um, uh, All Over Creation, um, which is a book about, um, it's about a woman who, um, comes back to her Idaho family. Um, her fa her parents um, uh, have, you know, been well. They're they're. Um, she she comes from potato country, right? And so she goes back to her community, a potato farming community, um, to take care of her father who's dying, and. Um, and it's a, so it's about the incursion of genetically modified potatoes into this, you know, into this, um, uh, this farming community and the impact of, you know, of biotech in these, you know, on, on family farms. Um, and so it's, but it's asking the question too about, you know, about authenticity and about representation and about reality. The, um, in my year of meets, um, the, the question is really, very much about the documentary, you know, uh, it's a, it, the, the protagonist is making a documentary television show that purports to represent, um, you know, m meat in an accurate way. It purports to represent reality, right? But in fact, of course, it doesn't um, because it's, it's being bought and paid for by the meat lobby. Um, and in the um, All Over Creation, you know, this genetically modified potato has this huge corporate, um, you know, public relations you know, effort behind it to try to, you know, convince farmers and consumers that, that this is, you know, this is real, you know, this is an Idaho potato. Um, and so, again, it's, it's about how, the, both of those books, I think, are very much about the way corporate dollars um, skew what we see as, you know, as being real, right? Mm. Um, and, and so it's not that big a leap then, to move from that those concerns right, right. to uh, the concerns of the the latter two books, right. yeah. Um, I want to hear you talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about the idea of um, a novel as uh, potentially performing an idea, as you've oh. um, described a tale for the time being doing, and I and I feel that this novel yeah. also performs. Form and emptiness. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess if a follow up to that is also, you know, are there any performance artists that um, that have influenced you? Uh, Probably. No, I can't really think of any performance artists. Um, I mean, film is also a kind of performance. So, I mean, obviously, it's 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 you know, it's all performance. Um, but. No, I, I, I can't really think of any performance artist per se who's, who's really influenced me, but there are a lot of filmmakers who have. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems to me that, uh, we were talking about this a little while, you know, earlier, um, that when I'm writing a novel, and tell me if you think this is true too, when I'm writing, when I am deep into writing a novel, I'm performing the novel, right? It, it, it's... It is a performative relationship I have with this, you know, this creative act. Um, and the person who is performing, and, and so this makes it difficult because, of course, the person who is performing that is not the same person, for example, who's sitting here talking to you now, right? Um, or not the same person as the person who's teaching my students at Smith, right? I, I wouldn't want that person in the same room with the students. I would want to keep them separate because I wouldn't trust the, you know, trust that person to, you know, to be in that teacher position. Um, so it, it's, 
you know, it, it's a very weird, all I'm, get, as I'm trying to say is that fiction writing is very weird. It's a weird performative kind of um, place that you go to in order to hear the voices and in order to evoke them on the page somehow you know, perform them on the page. I mean, that's what narrative voice is all about. Third person, I mean, obviously first person narrative is about that. But the third person voice is also performative, right? And this is something actually that I talk, you know, that my students and I talk about all the time. Um, and it's, you have to get inside it somehow in order to find that performance. Does that, do you find that to be true? I find it to be true. Yeah. Which yes. is why it's so hard to, to teach and write fiction, for example, because those are two different personas, right? right? Yeah, no, when you were talking, it just struck me that um, the language you used was active, right? Like that mm. writing is an act, actually. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, um, that's something that I came to later as a writer, mm. like when I was taught writing, mm. it was presented to me more as um, a, a product or like a thing that I would create, do mysterious things to create, but um, but you're right. Um, I I do feel when I'm writing that um, that it is performance. Yeah, a performance of self, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, or a performance of maybe not yourself, but yeah. some Fictional. some facet of yourself. Too. I mean, because I also think that all characters are in some way, and as, em as embarrassing as this might be, in some way facets of self. I'm, um, you know, they're they're. I, I just think of it as a novel as being kind of like a, you know, a dream, right? It, it's, you know, the dream is obviously something that is coming from my unconscious, right? Or wherever dreams come from. Um, but it's part of me, right? I mean, I'm, you know, I don't have a lot of control over it. Um, but it is arising somehow from my lived experience, right? And so writing um, is... Fiction writing, it, to me, it, the, the trick is to um, stay kind of open and receptive to that dream state, right. right? And this is why I teach my students to meditate. You know, it's the first thing that we do. Um, and not to meditate in that, you know, in the way that is often described in the West as being like, you know, empty your mind. It, no, not that, not that at all. It, it's really about being about finding a relaxed and receptive and spacious attitude, right? A, a way of sitting quietly in silence that is open to the, the performance when it arises, right? Um, to the elements of the dream when they arise. So do you yeah. meditate um, before you write, during writing? Sometimes I, sometimes I meditate before. I mean, very often what I do when I'm writing is just, um, you know, sort of just get very quiet, you know, and, and then I'll close my eyes and I'll just relax. You know, I mean, I guess partly because I've been meditating for, you know, formally for a long time. Um, it's easier to just kind of drop into that open you know, that open space. But if I start getting too kind of tight, right, I try to remind myself to relax and, you know, um, and sit back and, uh, you know, not force things, right? right? Um, and when I do that, that's, you know, it, it makes space for odd ideas to arise, right? right? Um, and, and those ideas are the ones that you want, but you can't really control them because as soon as you start to control them, then the more mundane functions of your brain take over and, and then things become kind of uninteresting. <laughs> I'm talking about for me. <laughs> well, it's, but, like, it's, yeah. it's like an image in a dream, right? You look yeah, at it exactly. and it disappears. Exactly, exactly. If you try to grab onto an image from a dream, it's just, it's gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating how that happens, yeah. Um, so this is kind of a little bit of a segue into mm. my next question, which is um, about um, psychology mm. or um, Western psychiatry or what you've called um, our biomedical culture. Mm. Um, in both um, A Tale for the Time Being and this book, there um, the, the central characters, the children mm. that we care very much for um, are struggling quite a bit. Um, 
uh, now in a tale for the time being is very suicidal mm -hmm. um, and depressed. And um, Benny, in this book, um, hears voices. He's also grieving his father. Mm -hmm. He also lives with a hoarding mom, so there's a lot of stress. Um, and and he's being diagnosed by um, by psychiatrists as having schizoaffective disorder, or schizophrenia. Um, but there is um, the the story, Both stories sort of push back against mm -hmm. um, those sort of diagnostic terms, I guess. Um, and it's interesting to me how um, the idea of suicide, for example, in A Tale for the Time Being um, sort of blurs or is in this line, boundary relationship with the idea of no self and no trace mm -hmm. um, that, that are Buddhist ideas that um, feel not pathological, right? right? And then, of course, um, the Benny's, um, uh, what could be called schizoaffective disorder is um, sort of um, beautifully um, compared to a Bodhisattva mm -hmm. um, canon who hears mm -hmm. the voices of all beings mm -hmm. sort of calling out um, in suffering yeah. um, mm -hmm. to her. So I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about um, why you're drawn to these topics and how, how also how your own conception of, um, of you know, these frameworks have evolved yeah. over time? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, first of all, you know, just to, just to kind of um, focus in on this idea of no self, what's beautiful about no self is that, you know, like all things Buddhistic, right, it's a paradox. Right. Um, because what no self means, in fact, is relationship. Mm. Right. Um, and I think that's what both of these books are about. It's about, you know, it's about alienation and saving, you know, finding some kind of salvation or liberation through um, relationship. Right. Um, and uh, and so in that and, and the relationship in particular with um, with writing, but also with community. Of, of some sort, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so with, with now, I, I think her, her um, real salvation is with her great-grandmother, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, who's really the only reliable, she's 104 years old and she's a Zen Buddhist nun and she's like the only reliable um, you know, adult in now's life. But she's not just any 104-year-old Zen Buddhist nun, she's like an anarchist feminist Zen Buddhist nun, um, so she's you know she's kind of special, um, and and in you know the uh, book of form and emptiness, it's really Benny's um, discovery of a of a the denizens of the library, you know the the um, this Slovenian um, uh, houseless uh, poet philosopher named Slavoj, um, who you know. Uh, holds literary salons in the library bathroom and, um, you know, the, uh, there's a performance, there's a performance artist, a conceptual artist um, named the Aleph who uh, Benny falls in love with. So in any case, Benny finds a community, right, of, of, um, of, of people there. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that, that's the, you know, that, that's kind of the, the balancing factor of no self, that, that yes, you know, we, we, in Buddhism, this idea of no self is kind of, is, is, um, it's a, it's a term, but it's also, um, you know, the idea is that yes, there's no individual self because all there is, is relationship, mm -hmm. right? And that's true. When you look at our lives, right, we might feel alienated, but in fact, we couldn't be here without the relationships that we have, right? This incredibly complex network of relationships that have brought us to this point of sitting on a, you know, sitting in these chairs, talking to each other. Um, and so uh, I think, um, anyway, you know, the way that relates to mental health, of course, is that, um, you know, mental illness is really, I think, an illness of alienation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, people often ask me, you know, why is it that I write about, um, you know, alienated, struggling, you know, in, the, in a tale for the time being, you know, a, a suicidal young girl, um, you know, a teenager, right? Well, it, 
it's kind of obvious because I was that person, right? Um, and I struggled like now did, right? When I was when I was in high school, um, I was hanging out in Cambridge, um, <laughs> and and it was really the you know it was my relationship with writing and also my re the relationships that I formed through writing um, that you know really um, kind of that really saved my life. Right, um, and I think the the same is true for Benny. You know, I mean, a lot of the, um, uh, you know, again, when I was in when I was in high school, I also, I mean, like Benny, um, ended up on a locked pediatric psych ward in in Concord, Massachusetts, um, and and that was a, you know, that was a pretty traumatic period, um, but at the same time, you know, it it, it th this I think is the thing about writing is that, you know, if you write, nothing is wasted. Right, and and so these are the you know these very formative experiences that I'd had um, when I was a you know when I was a child have stayed with me, and in that sense I think that you know that I still there's a part of me that still is that little girl. There's a part of me that still is the you know the kid who hears voices, um, and so you know we don't outgrow these things as much as we you know we embrace them, and you know and and. The writing to me is a is a way of um, being with those, you know, those persona, right, and um, and learning more about them, and uh, yeah, really kind of integrating and embracing them in some way. Now, the the to go back to this idea of the biomedical model, um, you know, it's it's. It's interesting because I, um, you know, when, when all of this was happening to me, it was a long time ago, and it was before, um, I mean, there were psychopharmaceuticals that were, you know, that, that I was certainly given, but it, the psychopharmaceutical industry wasn't what it is now, mm. right? Um, so that was a big difference. The other thing is that there wasn't, um, the insurance companies weren't as, you know, overblown as they are now, and um, so diagnosis was not you know, um, sort of pinpointing diagno you know, diagnosis was not as important as it is now because the, you know, now the bureaucracy is, is such that these diagnostic categories are, you know, are essential, right? Um, and so as a result, I somehow managed to, you know, make it through <laughs> and survive my childhood without receiving a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. In other words, I was never labeled. Right. right, and I think that this gave me an enormous amount of freedom because I think I certainly would have been labeled, you know, if I were growing up now, um, and so I think I had a kind of freedom there that I wouldn't have had, um, you know, if I if I were um, if I were growing up now, and so anyway, the the point of this is that um, you know there is no diagnostic test, there's no biomarker for any of these mental illnesses, right? Um, there's no biomarker for schizoaffective disorder. It's not like you can take a blood test, right, right and determine a diagnosis. It's a much more subjective art. Um, and that, you know, I really kind of question that. Um, and I question the idea of, you know, um, what we call normal right. in our culture. Um, Certainly, when I was growing up, I don't think I was normal, right? Um, but then again, when you think about it, normal is, is a cultural construct, right? We made this up. We make up what we think of as normal, right? And so it's, so it's a fiction, right? And this is something I feel like I know about fiction, right? Um, yeah. I practice fiction. Um, so my feeling is that, well, why can't we just take this fiction of normal and change it? Why can't we make it more you know, compassionate? Why can't we make it more generous? Why can't we expand it to be more inclusive, right? Um, and, and so these are the kinds of questions that I'm thinking of when I'm writing these books. Um, I have no answers to any of them. Um, I understand that, you know, mental illness is, is you know, it's real and it's, um, you know, it causes a tremendous amount of suffering. Um, I, I'm not anti-pharmaceutical at all. Um, you know, I, I take psychopharmaceuticals, so I am very grateful um, to that, for that. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm very much interested in exploring alternate kinds of support and modality for people who are suffering. Um, and there are, there are so many other modalities. Um, and so, 
when I was researching the Book of Form and Emptiness, I was very, I, um, you know, was doing a lot of research in the Hearing Voices Network, for example. Um, and I have friends who are, you know, who are voice hearers, um, and, you know, one of the things that they talk about is that, you know, not everyone who hears voices is um, suffers, right? A lot of, you know, a lot of people hear voices and live, you know, live very, uh, you know, in, in peace and harmony with the voices that they hear, right? It's not necessarily um, a marker for psychosis. Right. So anyway, these are the kinds of questions that were coming up when I was, when I was writing that book. Yeah, and what's really beautiful, I think, um, especially at this book, um, also in A Tale for the Time Being, but um, Benny meets um, these fun characters yeah, yeah. <laughs> who um, sort of help him see his voices in a different yeah. way and have a different relationship to them. And then they turn from, like you said, um, from these... Um, angry sort of self-harm type mm -hmm. voices into generative and like creative voices. Um, and it's, it's interesting to me to see how um, that like shift, you know, the story that um, he tells himself about something that he's experiencing actually not just helps him understand experience, mm -hmm. but shapes his future like the future expression of mm -hmm. his experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like this is an idea that's sort of like in the ether these days um, that, you know, the stories we tell um, matter for the future as well as for the past. Um, and I guess um, knowing that as a storyteller, um, do you ever think about, yeah, do you ever think about the, the fact that you're, I, I feel like you must, yeah. so maybe this isn't a very good question, but how do you think about, I guess, your responsibility as a storyteller? Oh, yeah. Um, that's, that's an interesting and thorny question in the sense that um, when, I'm, when I'm starting a novel, or when, and when I'm certainly, you know, for the many, many years it takes to, I'm a very slow writer. Um, and so it takes me eight, nine, ten years to write a book, right? Well, they're um, long. What? They're long. They're long. Oh. They're long. They're long. I keep vowing to write shorter books, and, and every book I, I think, this one is going to be really short. It's just going to be short, and it's going to be really quick to write. And then the years go by, you know. Um, when I'm writing, I'm not thinking about anybody else, mm. really. I mean, it's, it's a very you know, uh, it's a very internal world that I'm exploring. Um, I, I'm really not thinking about, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not thinking about publishing. Um, so writing and publishing are two very different things. Um, at some point, you start to make the transition. You start to realize, like, oh, wow, I'm actually going to finish this book. Wow, that's kind of shocking, right, 10 years later. Um, and then you start, and then I start to think like, oh, okay, now I need to start, you know, I, I, I need to think of this book as being something that is going out into the world, right? And then I start to, and so in the edit process, um, I start shaping it a little bit more, you know, in an, kind of an outward focused way. Um, you know, as a Buddhist practitioner, um, one of the, you know, we have um, sort of series of um, ethical precepts which, um, you know, w which we uh, live by. And um, right speech is one of the ethical precepts. Um, and, and right speech is one of those uh, precepts that, of course, covers writing. Right? Right? right meaning correct speech. Okay. Correct speech. Yep. In other words, um, yeah, in other words, uh, you know, trying to the best of your ability to um, to speak in a way that is uh, that is you know helpful and not harmful that is um, you know that that uh, that that's not going to you know um, it's not going to hurt people right and so that's something I do think about and and you know if I wrote a book and I can completely imagine writing a book that um, I need to write, but that does not need to be published. And, you know, 
in that case, I wouldn't. I wouldn't publish it. So those two things are separate, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that uh, it's really important to write what you need to write, um, but not perhaps necessary to publish everything that you write. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so those are kind of two separate things. Um, on the other hand, you know, it, it's... Um, I've found that every book I write... Um, you know, these are not absolute guidelines. They are completely, you know, relative and shifting all the time as we grow, as we develop, as the world changes, right? And so there's no, there's no kind of, when we talk about ethics, it is a, it is a fluid, you know, it's a fluid changing, um, uh, you know, relationship that you have with the world. And so, I've never written anything, I think, that doesn't at some point cause me some remorse, right? Mm. Um, where I think, oh, gosh, I could have been more skillful. I could have done that differently. Um, and that's good, actually, because remorse is a wonderful seed for writing, right? <laughs> as soon as I start feeling remorseful about something, I kind of want to look at it and try to understand what is it that caused me remorse, you know, and then try to write something, you know, that grows out of that yeah. seed of remorse, right? Yeah. And, and that's really how I started, that, that's how my writing career started. I felt so much remorse for the work that I did in television, mm. right? Um, working for, uh, you know, I mean, I, I worked for some terrible corporations when I was working in commercial TV. I worked for Philip Morris, you know, making sexy documentaries, you know, and lifestyle shows where I would go out onto the street, you know, with a pack of Marlboros and find, you know, attractive young people like you. And I would say, you know, here, would you like a cigarette? Would you smoke a cigarette <laughs> so that we can film you, right? Yeah. Making cigarette smoking look really attractive, right? And, and I, you know, I did this kind of work. You know, I worked for, yeah, I worked for some pretty nefarious companies. Um, and... And I felt really, you know, I, I felt quite remorseful about that um, and was really interested in trying to understand why I could have done that. You know, how was it possible? What part of me did I have to turn off? It was at a time, oh, I should mention too, it was at a time when I was trying to quit smoking. Like, I knew, <laughs> right? I knew that this was not okay, right? It was not good for me. Um, so I was desperately trying to quit smoking, and yet I was kind of, you know, inviting, you know, beautiful people like you to smoke cigarettes. Um, so, you know, the, and, and again, you know, the, it's, it, it raises this question about what is, you know, how, how is it that television, you know, is teaching us about reality, you know, and who's paying for that reality, right? In this case, it was Philip Morris. But I also worked for the U.S. Meat Export Federation, you know, making American meat look really scrumptious, you know. Um, so in that sense, you know, I was writing about stuff that I knew um, that had, you know, that had bothered me, right? And trying to, trying to understand um, what it was, you know. How, could, how did I, what kind of maneuver did I have to perform? Mm. Um, there's a wonderful book by Tracy, uh, oh gosh, what's her name? Stacy. Uh, Derasmo, um, called uh, Complicities. There's, there's one for you. Um, and uh, and it, it's um, a book that really looks at, you know, exactly this. You know, how can, what, what parts of ourselves do we have to, you know, shift and manipulate in order to be able to do what we do, right? Um, it's very interesting. It's a it's a great book, and it's a question that is fascinating to me. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much for sharing that. I'm sure that yeah. all the young people here will um, feel comforted to know that um, you know someone like you feels <laughs> remorse about everything. They, I feel remorse about written. everything. Yeah, yeah. I am constant. I am, yeah. I am crippled by remorse. Yeah, but it's it's okay. I mean, it's good. It's it's good. It's material. You know, don't smoke. <laughs> yeah. um, I feel I should open, I have probably a million more questions for you, <laughs> but I feel I should open um, the floor up to uh, questions from the yeah. audience. <laughs> Anyone? 
And please wait for the uh, mic runners. I'd just love to hear a little bit more about what brought you to Buddhism. Oh, what brought me to Buddhism, yeah. Um, you know, the, the story of the Buddha is interesting because, you know, what, you know, the Buddha was a historical, you know, uh, Siddhartha Gautama, right, who was a prince, right? And, um, and his uh, father, uh, the king, had sheltered him, right, from reality, Right, um, and he was, you know, he was um, kept in, a, you know, he was in a palace, and and um, one day he snuck out of the palace, and he saw, um, you know, a, a sick person, an old person, and a corpse, right, um, and he realized the truth of sickness, old age, and death for the first time. He had never, you know, that never occurred to him. Um, and, and that's usually what it is that brings people to Buddhism. It, it's that kind of suffering. And for me, it was very much when my, um, my parents were uh, getting old. I mean, I had been meditating and interested in Buddhism all my life. Um, it was, you know, my Japanese grandparents were practicing Buddhists. Um, I didn't know them well, though. Um, but when my own parents um, started, uh, you know, getting sick and reaching the end of their lives, um, I'm an only child, and I realized... You know, I mean, I was going to have to take care of them, and I was not equipped to do that. Um, uh, you know, I really did not have the backbone I needed um, in order to do that. And um, the thing that helped me was meditation, was sitting meditation, and also the, you know, the sangha, the group of practitioners um, who I was sitting with. And, um, and so it was really uh, desperation, you know, um, that that brought me to it, and then I, you know, struggled. Uh, I think um, for for years because um, I, I wasn't quite sure how Buddhism and writing were going to go together, and you know, um, especially since I had made this decision to um, ask for ordination, you know, and, and the reason I did that was because the practice had helped me so much, I felt like it was something that I wanted to, you know, be able to pass along, just be a kind of link in the chain. Um, but, you know, I, I think um, the practice itself has, has really, um, I'm not sure I would still be writing if I weren't also, you know, practicing Buddhism. There, there was something, there's something in that practice that um, keeps me engaged with the kinds of questions that um, make me want to write, you know? Um, and, uh, and it also um, helps me with things like patience, right? I'm not a very patient person by nature. I'm actually a very impatient person. Um, but meditation teaches you patience. It teaches you to, to sit with, you know, a novel for the 10 years if it takes to write one for me. You know, um, so uh, I'm not sure I would have. I'm not sure I would have those skills had I not uh, really been developing this Buddhist practice. Um, but anyway, it was it was sickness, old age, and death. It was suffering that brought me to Buddhism. Yeah. Oh, where are the runners? Hello. Thank you for being here today, Ruth. Um, I was wondering if you'd be willing to share um, some of those stories you wrote for yourself uh, rather than for publication. Oh, gosh. Um, well, they're, let's see now. Uh, they're not very good stories, I'm afraid. Um, there was, uh, there was one that never quite got off the ground that was a war story um, set in Hawaii. I'm not sure why, um, what it was about that story that, it, it was actually interesting because um, it was a story that was set in Hawaii during World War II. And um, the one of the characters in that story was um, a character who ended up in, uh-oh, um, Haruki number one, in, in A Tale for the Time Being, right. It was, uh, you know, it was the, suddenly 
the characters, you know, they, they have lives of their own and they migrate from book to book. And so it's hard to keep track of them. It's like one minute they're in one book and then the next minute they're in another book, you know. Um, so it was a character, it was Haruki number one who ended up in A Tale for the Time Being who started his life in this other book, right, called Kaboom. Um, don't ask me. Um, <laughs> and uh, I still think, I think as a title, it's a great title. And, it, you know, I might end up going back to it. it, it you know, it was interesting, too, because some of the characters in A Tale for the Time Being, an early draft of A Tale for the Time Being, um, the Ruth and Oliver characters were not in that draft at all. The, instead, there were a group of characters who lived in a library, right, who were in A Tale for the Time Being. Yes. And when I... I had to throw them out for various reasons, right? I, I, it, they weren't working, you know? They had found the wrong book. And so I moved them out of there and I put Ruth and Oliver in, right? Let them in, and they were good. Um, and then, but those characters didn't want to stay in my hard drive and they ended up in this book, right? So there's a whole kind of gossipy, weird backstory that's happening in my hard drive all the time where, you know, <laughs> they're shifting around and they're moving locations and I just wake up and find this chaos in my, you know, in my hard drive. But they, they sort it out. Wait, so is it the, is it Slavoj and yeah. Aleph yeah. were yeah. originally yeah. readers of... Yeah, Slavoj, Slavoj um, and, uh, yeah, Slavoj and the Elif were um, originally in the library. The bindery, the library as a location uh -huh. was originally in A Tale for the Time Being. Um, the bindery was in A Tale for the Time... All of that was in A Tale for the Time Being. Yeah, 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 yeah. But they... It, yeah, it was... It was um, they just didn't want to... It didn't work. It, it, you know, they didn't work in that, in that context for various reasons. They, they were working, um, but then the earthquake and tsunami happened, mm. right? And then suddenly the world was different, and so I had to adjust. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much for speaking. I'm a huge fan, and I was oh, really curious about what you said about co-creation, because I think in a digital age, like, a lot of the social media platforms and different mediums we see arising, like fan fiction, fan art, is a product of that, like, easier access to media and then easier access to these, like, platforms where you can co-create. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if this feeds back into your creative process in any way, like whether this affects the way you write or interact with your audiences. It, it, you mean the, the, the whole, the, the world of fan fiction and, and plat, uh, social media platform just, I guess, like, yeah. the internet and the, internet, um, yeah. the digital yeah. Yeah. age. Yeah. Um, hmm. I, sp I do spend a lot of time on the internet, probably way too much. Um, I do go down lots of rabbit holes and call it research. Um, and that some of that's legitimate, right? And some of it is just me wasting time. <laughs> um, but in terms of, um, you know, I know that there have been fan fiction, you know, that's written with characters in, in my books. And, um, and I haven't read it because I have my own experience with them, right? Um, and, but, you know, People obviously, every reader, as I said, every reader has their experience of it, and if that's <clears throat> how a reader wants to, you know, respond, then you know that's it, it's not my it's not my business to object or to have any opinion about it at all, you know, except to be grateful that they've, you know, that they've read the book and been interested, um, which I am. Um, so, you know, but it, it's interesting because I have such an intense relationship with my books and my characters that I, I don't have room for an alternate version of them, right? It, it's just not real to me, right? Um, so much so that, for example, when, um, you know, the audio book of the Book of Form and Emptiness came out, I, I read um, A Tale for the Time Being. I did my own audio book reading for that, and it was 
one, I, I had a wonderful experience doing it. I had so much fun doing it. Um, I didn't have time to, to do it for um, the Book of Form and Emptiness. I thought that was going to be okay, and it's not okay. Um, the actor who read it is very, you know, I mean, he, he's a professional, um, but it, it's not my book anymore, right? And so I've asked, and at some point I'm going to be re-recording um, because I suddenly, I realized, like, you know, I, I, I want the record to be my reading of it, right? I want my reading of it to be in the world. Um, because, of course, an actor is going to do it, you know, it, it becomes his reading. It becomes his book. Um, and it, there's not, it's not that that's not valid. It's completely valid. It's just not the way I hear it, right? Um, so, anyway, it's, it's a kind of a slight offshoot of what you're asking, um, but I, you know, I, I'm, um, uh, you know, uh, the internet is just, it's the sea we swim in, it's the air we breathe, um, and, and so, you know, yes, it has become very much a part of the way that I think, I think too, um, and the way that, I, and certainly the way that I write. Yeah. There's... Here and over here, yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, you talked about with your, your first book having not done an MFA program, not really knowing what you were allowed to or not allowed to do. Yeah. And it sounded in some ways like this sort of writer's beginner's mind. Yeah. But then apparently your books have just gotten weirder and weirder and weirder. <laughs> um, and so I'm wondering how you, how you managed to hold on to it, how you felt that you kept it. I think that's Buddhism. I think the Buddhism has really helped me. Um, it's helped me, it, it's helped me, um, gosh, how to, how to explain this or how to, how to articulate it. Um, it, it helped, it's helped me sort of stay open to things that are unconventional. Right. It, it, I think it helps me, um, and, and a lot of that has to do with patience, too. You know, staying with something until it's, until it's right in a way that I recognize it to be right. Because the first draft of something, I mean, I'm assuming that you're probably a writer. Um, no? <laughs> it's such a writerly question. Um, but, you know, the first draft of something is, is generally not very good. You know, it, it's pretty, con I mean, it can be very conventional. And that's very discouraging because it, you know, it's a little, there's cliches, there's like, you know, characters who have sweating palms and rapidly beating hearts and, you know, all of the, the cliches that, you know, that is fine at the beginning. You know, it, it's kind of a placeholder, a reminder to come back, right? But then the, um, the uh, you know, the, the, sort of physical part of the meditation practice, I think, helps me get past that. And um, to give you a more concrete example, um, in A Tale for the Time Being, I wish I had a copy of it here, um, there's a, uh, a scene where now is being, um, she, she's been bullied at school, and so her, she's got little cuts and bruises all over her body, and her mother has discovered that, and, um, and is actually inspecting her body, right, and finding these little cuts and bruises. And it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a very kind of nerve-wracking situation for now, who is narrating this, right? <clears throat> and, um, and so I think in an early draft of, of that, um, you know, the, the, you know, it was, it, I probably had Now's heart, you know, rapidly beating and, you know, sweating and whatever. Um, and, and then, you know, coming back to that scene and realizing like, no, this is, you know, I, I wrote it quickly the first time, so now I have to come into this scene, I have to really, I have to really sink into this scene, right? And really try to understand and visualize it and feel it. And this is where the performance comes in, right? Um, and so, you know, what I would do in that case is to, you know, sit at the computer or wherever and close my eyes and kind of drop into, you know, a meditation body-mind, right? But 
drop into the body mind of the character, right? And which I, um, so I know what it feels like to, you know, to be kind of relaxed and receptive and open in my own body. So it's just a small shift then to be able to close my eyes and drop into the body mind of the character because I know her quite well by now. And so, the, you know, I'm standing there and, and then, I can, then I can see and feel what's happening around her, right? And I can feel, you know, the, exactly what the tatami feels like underneath her, you know, underneath her bare feet in that apartment, which is not a very nice apartment, you know. And I can kind of smell, you know, what it would smell like in that building. And I can, you know, feel what she is feeling in her stomach, Right. And what emerged from there was the metaphor of a fish, right? That it was, um, that there was, that she felt, I, and I don't remember the language that I used, but um, that she describes it as feeling like she was cradling um, a fish that was dying in her stomach, right? Um, and it, it goes on from there. It's a much more involved um, metaphor. And, um, and so I wrote that, and then that felt right. Right, um, and then, but what was interesting about that is having established that fish in Nao's, you know, belly, um, that those fish metaphors started to proliferate, and then they, you know, so these fish started sort of swimming through the whole novel, right? Um, and and you know, I, I mean, I don't think it's an unconventional way to write, but it's just that I, I think that having, I, I feel like I kind of lucked into. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a practice, you know, a, a spiritual practice that allows me to, you know, to, and I'm probably misusing meditation in some really terrible way, and the Zen police are going to be knocking at the door, and they're going to, you know, haul me off to the monastery to retrain me. Um, but anyway, that's, you know, and, and so the, the idea, you know, is, is, you know, finding that kind of spaciousness of mind um, allows for the dream state to come up. And you know how weird your dreams are. Your dreams, I'm sure, are weird, right? I mean, mine are. Everybody's dreams are weird. So how do you access that? How do you, you know, how do you invite that weirdness, you know, in, into your fiction? Um, and this is a way that, you know, works, sort of works sometimes for me. Sort of, sometimes. <laughs> we were great fans of your fish in oh, really? class. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah. No, the fish thing was really interesting. Oh, oh yeah. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll just say I was a big lover of the fish metaphor. Excellent. Um, also, I'm thinking of trying to write something from the perspective of non-human animals. Um, yeah. And also, another thing I loved about A Tale for the Time Being was your inclusion of the jungle crow. Oh, um, yeah. And you even had like a couple of scenes told from the crow's perspective. That's right. And so I was wondering. Crows in this book too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was wondering like, yeah. how can you adapt that like using Buddhism and meditation to like drop into the like mind or body of a character with like non-human organisms? Mm. Yeah, well, you know, it, I mean, I think actually it's probably not much more than a, you know, what I'm describing here is um, something that writers and, you know, poets uh, have always done. Um, it's just that, you know, I'm approaching it from a Buddhist perspective, so I have a certain kind of language around it. Um, but it's, it's an act of imagination, right? It's, it's an act of total imagination um, so that you, you know, you, you close your eyes and you, you know, put yourself in the body mind of whatever it is that you're, you know, that you're writing from and you you try to embody that. But I think I think one of the problems is that when we're writing, we tend to look for words too soon rather than um, rather than sensation, right? And I think that's the other thing about meditation is that it's a nonverbal activity. Right, so 
when we're when we're meditating, I mean, there are meditations that you can do where you're labeling your thoughts and you're labeling, you know, you're using language. The kind of meditation that I um, am schooled in is um, uh, it, it's the um, the Zen tradition is Soto Zen, and um, do, well, if you've read, you know, Dogen, you, you know Dogen, right? Um, Dogen Zenji is the, um, it, it, it was the founder of Soto Zen in Japan, and, um, and he, the meditation he teaches is an objectless meditation. It's, it's a, um, it's a, it's a nonverbal, objectless meditation. The way he describes it is, um, think not thinking. How do you think not thinking? non-thinking. Now, I know this makes no sense at all, but the idea is that it's a non-conceptual meditative state where you are, you know, you are just open and aware. One of the things that's interesting is that in Buddhism, you know, it, it, we have, we all think of ourselves as having five senses, right? Um, that, right? You all have five senses, more or less, right? Okay. Um, and in Buddhism, though, there's six senses. And the sixth, okay, so the sense gates are the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the skin, right? And the mind, the mind is the sixth sense gate, right? And the sensations that the mind perceives are your thoughts and feelings, which means that your thoughts and feelings are really nothing more or less than a smell or a sound or a taste, right? But in the West, we tend to, we really privilege our, you know, this mind gate. And this becomes the controlling, you know, apparatus that we use to, um, you know, to, to interact with the world. Um, and, and in, I think, one of the shifts that's ha that happens with um, long meditation practice is that it becomes a kind of less conceptual activity. Right, and so when you know when I'm talking about these acts of imagine, you know, the, these this practice of imagination, it's a it's a much more it's a much more sensual kind of imaginative state, right? Where you're really sensing something with body and mind, you know, with all of the sense gates open, right? Um, and 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 still, you know, I mean, I can't really inhabit the body mind of a crow. I wish I could. Wouldn't that be amazing? I used to play this game when I was a little kid. Um, my friend Jane and I would, um, you know, say if you could, you know, if you, you have to choose, right? If you could be for like, you know, five minutes, if you could be a crow or an elephant, which would you choose, right? And we would, you know, sort of go on and on about this. But it would be an amazing thing to be able to inhabit the subjectivity of another being, right? Even another human being, that would be pretty wild too. Um, but especially a non-human being, right? So we can't really do it, but we can, you know, we can do it in our imaginations um, and try to do it in a way that is really, you know, with all of the sense gates open, right? Because when you're, you know, if, I mean, I imagine air is a very different sensation to a crow than it is to me, right? So then, what would that feel like, right? I think we have time for one more question. Okay, I'm sorry, I tend to go on and on. I'll, I'll try to answer more quickly. Hi. Hi. Um, so I don't have a lot of time to read fiction these days, but I read uh, A Tale for the Time Being on a bus from Montreal back to here oh. uh, on Monday in preparation for this, and I, I absolutely loved it. I'm not a creative writer, but maybe one day I will be. Yeah. And so I have a question about fiction, about reality, and about writing, and, and to go back to the question of ethics too, actually, yeah. just yeah. in general. And this is a genuine question. It's not a, an on-the-spot one. I'm, it, it, I think it might help me in my future yeah. writing, which is about the role of real people in your novels and in your writing practice and your responsibility to them to, to feed back to and maybe make the kind of more abstract discussion from earlier a bit more precise. Yeah. And I ask that for um, one reason, which is because I'll make like a faux pas, I think, that, that people uh, avoid in literary criticism, which is to ask who Ruth is yeah. in A Tale for the Time Being. Yeah. And then to wonder if the other people are also based on real people and sort of what 
responsibility do you feel or sort of any kind of ethical uh, tendency towards how real people and representation enter into your fiction? And, and I'll close with one example that's a relatively banal one that comes up in the book, which is the falling man in 9-11 and how that image gets circulated throughout popular media in a way that doesn't really do justice to the gravity of, of, of that individual human being. Right. Um, and so maybe just how generally that factors into your own practice, if it does at all, and if mm -hmm. that's even an interesting question. It's a really interesting question. Thank you for asking it. Um, I think that the, uh, you know, again, there's no simple answer to that, right? Um, so, you know, to ask who is Ruth is, um, the answer is going to be different than who is the falling man, right? Um, and uh, it's going to be different from who is Oliver and who is the postmistress and, you know, all of the other... Uh, pets, uh, pesto. <laughs> pesto was a real cat. Um, but, he, okay, so here's the... You know, I had, this, I, I had this rule for myself that if I was going to use real people in the book... And, and I, you know, I make rules for myself, so that's one thing. Um, if I was going to use real people in the book, they would need to give me permission, right? And so uh, there's uh, uh, the, the professor at Stanford, I think, um, David Palumbo Liu, um, is a real person. Um, and I asked him if he would mind being in my book, and he said no, he would, he would be happy to be in my book. Um, there are a couple of other people who are real people who I've asked to. The friends of the police to scene are real. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. So those are real people, but I got their permission. Um, so that was my that was my rule. Now the thing is, Pesto was a real cat, but that wasn't his real name. Um, and when I asked him if. I could use him in the book. He turned his back on me and started licking his asshole, and and I took that, <laughs> I took that as a no, right? So I gave him I you know I gave him a pseudonym and disguised him so that he wouldn't be recognizable, um, and that was the way that I dealt with a lot of people who I couldn't actually ask, right? Um, one of the things that was interesting is that in um, you know, on this little island, the island is so small. Whale Town is a real place. I lived there for, you know, decades. Oh, are you? Okay, so then yeah, Cortez Island. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, but, you know, so it's a, you probably recognized it. It's a real place. Um, in, a, in a small town like that, in a small place like that, everyone is recognizable. Yeah. Everyone is recognizable. And so I went out of my way to disguise people's identities and make composites and everything else, right? I really tried hard to disguise people's identities and stuff. And what happened when the book came out was that half the people were, um, you know, half the people were, like, you know, convinced that they were in the book, right? And the other half of the people were angry that they weren't in the book, right? And so <laughs> there was a kind of tension there. Um, but, uh, you know, generally... I try to approach those things, you know, I do think a lot about how much I'm going to, um, you know, how, how real are these people going to be and um, do I need their consent or not. Um, with Oliver, you know, I'm married to him. Uh, and it was his idea anyway. So, and, you know, that I should step into the book as a real person. Um, and the reason was, was, you know, we wanted, I wanted to... Um, you know, I wanted to kind of break the fiction. I wanted to break the fictional world of the book and introduce, you know, myself as a real character in order to acknowledge the brokenness of the fiction. And, you know, Oliver uh, had kind of suggested this, and I said, yeah, that, that uh, it's a good idea, and I'll be in the book if you're in the book. You know, if I'm going to be there, you have to be there too. And, and he agreed. So I, again, got his consent. And he is not unhappy. Um, but he does think that I made him too smart, um, and he's <laughs> and he's afraid that it, when people meet him, that they're going to be disappointed. But that's not true, actually. <laughs> he's smarter than the Oliver in the book, even. So, <laughs> but it's a it's a really good question. Thank you for asking that. Yeah. 
Well, I yeah. think he is not unhappy is a nice way to <laughs> end this conversation. Thank you so much for yeah. being here with us, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.